Iceland is known globally as a geothermal paradise, a geographically unique place where conditions are perfect to allow cheap and widespread production of geothermal energy. These conditions include rocks with a lot of pore space, water inside the pores, all in a region where there is a lot of heat very close to the surface. These characteristics taken together create hydrothermal resources. We know where most hydrothermal resources that are close to the surface, like Iceland, are located globally. But there are situations where hydrothermal resources exist entirely underground with no surface evidence. No steam rising, no hot springs. These so-called blind hydrothermal systems may exist in many places around the world, much more commonly than is currently understood, which presents the potential to develop hydrothermal geothermal energy on a much larger scale. So what tools and data sets can we use to predict where in the world blind hydrothermal exists? What are the methodologies used to develop blind hydrothermal projects? And how large could this resource be globally? Let's explore. Great. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Um, and welcome to this, uh, this session. Um, title of this session is In Search of Iceland Underground, Blind Hydrothermal. Uh, my name is Nick Cameron, um, and uh, I'll introduce myself in a moment. I'm really excited to be, to be moderating this panel. We've got a great uh, selection of panelists to, to talk to um, today, and uh, I really hope this is going to be going to be a great discussion. So, um, like I say, my name's Nick. Um, I've been working for BP as a petroleum geologist for about 25 years um, and recently led BP's look at geothermal that culminated in its making an investment last year. So really excited about geothermal in general and this concept of blind hydrothermal, as you might have just seen on the video, the idea of exploring for um, geothermal resources that are not evident at the surface, that are not associated with volcanoes or hot springs or boiling mud pits or anything like that. I'm really interested in that as, a, as an exploration and a petroleum geologist. I'm conscious that in oil and gas, we've, you know, over the last hundred years, we've moved away from needing to look for oil seeps and tar sands and, and boiling, burning cliffs and things like that. We've been able to develop techniques to find oil and gas that weren't evident at the surface. And part of me is thinking, well, how can we do the same with geothermal? How can we go out and, and find these blind hydrothermal resources that are not associated with, um, with hydrothermal, with evident surface expressions? So that's me and that's why I'm interested. Um, let's go ahead and introduce the panel. Um, so first, uh, Kirsten, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as Nick said, my name is, is Kirsten Marcia. I'm, uh, I'm joining you today from the province of Saskatchewan uh, up in Canada, uh, where we're working on a hot sedimentary aquifer uh, power project for geothermal. Um, definitely blind when you're walking across the, uh, the, the Saskatchewan prairies, the last thing you're thinking about is, is geysers or, or, or any kind of geothermal resource. And um, we love the irony that we wouldn't know that this geothermal resource existed here in Saskatchewan if it weren't for the oil and gas industry um, exploring for, for hydrocarbons. Um, and so here we are today, now uh, just uh, completed the feasibility engineering reports and advancing towards construction. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. Very, very exciting. Um, let's go to Carl next. Carl, would you mind introducing yourself? Thank you, Nick, and hi, everyone. I'm pleased to be here today. My name is Carl Hoyland, and I'm a geologist by training. I received a PhD from Stanford University and spent a little time in oil and mineral exploration before transitioning entirely to geothermal. I'm currently an Activate Fellow at the Berkeley National Lab, and am co-founder and CEO of a venture-backed technology startup called Zanskar, where we're focused on building new exploration tools to de-risk geothermal development. And in particular, we're focused on advanced seismic methods for characterizing permeability in situ and on geostatistical frameworks for guiding better decision-making. I'm especially excited about today's session because I believe conventional geothermal resources, most of which are hidden from view, uh, warrant special attention for two reasons. One, they don't require new blue sky technologies and so represent the fastest way to add gigawatts of firm renewable generation to the grid within the next five years. And two, I believe a robust conventionals industry can provide a long-term foundation upon which to build and by which to finance the development and testing and growth of our unconventionals industry. 
uh, I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Carl. Um, so next up, we have uh, Gazelle. Gazelle, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, <clears throat> hello everybody. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, very pleased to be here with this uh, a great panel uh, uh, fellows. Uh, my name is Gazal Izadi. I am a Global Technical, Adv uh, Technical Advisor for Unconventional Reservoir and Geothermal in Baker Hughes, based in California. So my background is uh, geomechanics and reservoir engineering. Um, I was introduced uh, to geothermal during my PhD program at Penn State University back in 2009. Uh, my experience from resource exploration development, uh, such as uh, planning, well drilling, completion strategies, understanding the fluid flow, stimulating enhanced geothermal system, as well as uh, uh, evaluating the risk of induced seismicity. So currently, uh, my focus is uh, to connect subsurface and reservoir stimulation to surface design and turbine construction. We believe uh, through this integration, we can really shorten the turbine lead time. And we can assess and mitigate the risk and optimize the performance uh, in order to reduce the total project cost. So, so we're happy to be here today and looking forward to this discussion. And uh, last, but by no means least, uh, Bob, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Thank you, Nick. I thought you were going uh, beauty before age, but uh, it's a real honor to be here with the, with the panel today. I, I'm Bob Gales. I'm the uh, Chief Geoscientist for the Geoscience Production Group at Halliburton. I'm located in Houston. So I have a team of uh, similar uh, folks, experienced folks in the, in the industry that we covered projects, full spectrum of oil and gas, and I've also had uh, several people have been involved in uh, global geothermal projects. So I started as a field engineer, a lot of people in the, this industry that uh, focus on the subsurface. I actually had the pleasure of logging a 200 C well, not far from where the Utah Forge project is. And I worked on the data acquisition uh, post stimulation on the Fenton Hill dry hot rock project. So I'm dating myself a little bit. So I've got a long history in uh, playing with geothermal. But uh, my, uh, most of my career is about 30 years in the service industry and, about, and with operators has been focused on the subsurface. But the advantage of time is I got to work on a lot of projects. So a lot of unconventional projects, a lot of hot projects. So I've got to work on uh, a lot of heavy oil steam where you got a lot of the hot temperatures we have to deal with from a monitoring perspective, well construction. You got to work on several in-situ combustion projects. So now we get to really high temperature stuff to play with. And then I got to work on several geothermal power projects, predominantly uh, high temp, but a couple of low temp, temp ones. The one thing that uh, interested me was there was a statement yesterday, geothermal is 30 years in the making. And that made me think of all the stuff that I worked on on unconventionals, which I've been in it 40 years and I've been doing unconventional since I started. So it's been tight gas all the way through to where we're at today. But the thing that stands out from that is the constant goal for improvement, the knowledge, the technology, the implementation, the integration. And I look at it, the Barnett Shell took us 17 years to reach success. So it relates to our 30 years. If you look at what we do today with what we've learned, we've shortened that learning cycle. So when we go to new plays, we get the right information early in the cycle so that we can actually plan to optimize well placement, type of completions, type of stimulations. All that's driven the cost down and the efficiency up. So I see the same type of thing happening at Geothermal. I'm quite excited uh, to join the panel today. Great, thanks, thanks, Bob. Um, so really, really exciting topic to, to get our teeth into, this, this concept of, uh, of blind hydrothermal developments, as opposed to, and, and I'm sure the audience, you will have seen the, 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 the panoply of different topics of geothermal that are on, on offer this week. Um, you know, hot dry rocks and EGS systems and, and all sorts of things. But today, let's let's focus on this this concept of blind hydrothermal um, resources. So, Kirsten, it sounds from your intro there like you're as, as somebody already working in this in this in this vein. Um, perhaps you could start out by saying, well, what are blind hydrothermal systems and what characteristics do they have? Well, certainly from our perspective, what, what we've been looking on is that they're just not obvious. Right. I mean, this is these are systems that, um, you know, often deeper in the ground, 
in our situation, um, you know, we're focused on a hot sedimentary aquifer. So we're in the Williston Basin. The Williston Basin is a, is a large sedimentary basin that hosts here in Saskatchewan potash resources, our oil and gas resources. And at the very bottom of this basin, before you hit the Precambrian, base, Precambrian Shield, um, is a, a deep hot aquifer that was drilled numerous times um, by the oil and gas industry. So in some ways, maybe not blind because people did know that there was an aquifer there. But if you're in the oil and gas business, the last thing you want is, is water. Water is, is an operational cost versus, you know, something that's going to provide you revenue. That, that was the, the historical thinking. And so I think it's almost this kind of like a, a double meaning of the blind. Like it's, it's blind in that you can't see it from surface for sure, but also blind in that there's an industry that, that, that ignored it. Um, so here in, in Canada, our wells are actually public knowledge. So when you drill a well, um, you have to submit that information into these public well bases. So we were able to go exploring um, using a laptop. Uh, and so we were able to determine that that, that heat resource was there. Um, and then uh, Sun Sinsen have drilled uh, numerous wells into it. So that's, you know, from that our perspective, it, it's blind in that you wouldn't know it was there um, if you didn't poke a hole into it. Um, and certainly, you know, from an industry standpoint, you know, opening our eyes to what some of these otherwise ignored resources can do. Very, very good. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. So what other blind hydrothermal projects exist in the world, apart from the one that you're drilling on in the, in the, in the Wilson Basin? Um, uh, are, are you aware of any, any other ones? Or, um, Bob, sounds like you've got a lot of experience in the, in the industry. Where... Maybe to, to question to you, perhaps, um, what other blind hydrothermal systems are we are we already developing? That's a good, a good question. And since I've been mostly focused on uh, North America, I can't answer for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But in preparation, uh, you know, started doing a little bit of research. And so there actually is projects underway and ongoing in several other countries in, in the world. But I think uh, Kirsten hit upon it about the whole blind. The thing that really stood out, there was a huge study done in the US in 2005. So we've been looking at this for quite a while. And at that time, they come up there with a 2000 times the amount of energy we could get some sedimentary geothermal in the US as compared to the amount of oil we were pumping every day. Wow. If you look at just the Western US with an update of that that was done recently, there's 500,000 megawatts of sedimentary basin geothermal source available. And the biggest chunk of that is probably going on in the Great Basin uh, out in the Nevada area where they've been increasing the uh, production. That's a, that's a huge, that's a huge resource just, just in the US alone, I guess. Um, so uh, where, where else in the world might, do you think, I mean, obviously in the title, we've got, we've got Iceland, finding Iceland underground. And Iceland, as, as the video said, um, you know, is hugely um, familiar to, to many people as, as, a, as, as a center of, of volcanism, you know, sitting on a, on a hot spot on a plate boundary. And um, obviously conventional geothermal is developed around the world in, in places where we have evident volcanism, plate boundaries, Pacific Ring of Fire, things like that. Where, what sort of settings in the world do we, do we think that we might find? Where would we go looking for these sorts of hydrothermal resources? Carl, you, you've got some, some expertise and some background in, in, in exploration and, and geophysical imaging. What, what, where do you think we, might, we, we ought to be looking if we're, if we're going to go and find this sort of thing? Yeah, and no, I, I want to also point out that you know, within these blind resources, we have different types and plays uh, available to us. And really historically, the only type that have been successfully developed have actually been blind fault hosted systems, uh, which is really the dominant style in Nevada or Great Basin style geothermal systems, which we're also finding in East Africa or Turkey. Um, and in these systems, it's worth pointing out that half of the operating geothermal fields today uh, that are fault hosted were discovered entirely by accident. Whereas the other half of those fault hosted systems actually had hot springs or geysers, fumaroles at the surface. And so um, I think it's pretty telling to think about that, to realize that our exploration capabilities are still somewhat unproven and immature uh, compared to oil and gas, as you pointed out at the beginning, which got away from seeps and accidental discoveries long ago. Um, and so for us, at places where we know there's high heat flow, 
and where we know there's natural permeability, whether that's faults, which is kind of the easiest target and, and has been our primary target to date. But increasingly, we're finding some of these deep, hot sedimentary basins can also have natural porosity or permeability, um, which can be commercial in some cases. And so, um, yeah, primarily targeting those two, two features, high temperatures and permeability. The Great Basin offers one of the best opportunities here in the US. And similar to as Bob pointed out, uh, when you run the numbers on it, you start to realize uh, that just that conventional opportunity, which doesn't even require stimulation or advanced technologies, um, is potentially larger than the entire conventional oil reserve of the Gulf of Mexico. And so I, I think we often underestimate how significant of an economic opportunity this is, as well as that opportunity to help with the energy transition. So, Gazelle, you, you mentioned earlier about, uh, about the, the sorts of plants and, and, and turbines and things for, for, for development. Um, in talking about, we're talking about something slightly different from a subsurface setting from, from lots of geothermal that, that's currently developed. Are we, are we still talking about the same sorts of um, mechanisms for development of converting that, that geothermal energy into power or, or useful heat? Um, the same sorts of temperature ranges as we'd find in other geothermal settings? Uh, would, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so if you, uh, as you mentioned, Nick, uh, when we are looking at the traditional geothermal activity and the marketplace, uh, uh, it's more uh, around ring of fire, which namely uh, we can uh, count from the entire coastal area of the Pacific Ocean in Asia, expanding uh, to uh, coast of California all the way to Chile. So most of this ring of fire area, we are uh, looking at the volcanic system. Uh, however, the, uh, the, the geothermal would be categorized in two segments, right? Power generation, which as of today, we have around 15.9 gigawatts installed capacity globally. And when you look at the district heating, uh, which we are looking at a different type of geological setting and the temperature group, we have developed around 7.3 gigawatts. So what we so based on the, uh, the geological condition, the fluid composition, and the temperature group, we need to provide the right solution at the surface side. So um, there is a there is an interesting research by Rice that that we are go going to see a big shift right uh, in the next uh, five uh, to six years that most of the hydrothermal activities was currently in Iceland and Turkey, which is coming both from Europe uh, um, side, and this shift is going through the Asia Pacific, which goes through the uh, um, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Australia. So um, I think one of the key component that Col uh, highlighted is understanding the fault system because they bring different type of geological characteristics, porosity and permeability temperature and the fluid type and the quality of the fluid, which we are talking about the pure water, hot water, or maybe in the combination of the fluid and the steam. So based on this type of uh, fluid uh, characteristics that we get from downhole uh, and the temperature and the rate of the fluid. So we need to uh, get these components in order to uh, select the right technology, either it's a steam turbine, a uh, different type of uh, system, either single, double, or triple flash, as well as ORC, which is uh, both for lower and higher enthalpy fluid system. Right, so, so sure. both, both flash systems Can I and, and quick there, uh, Nick? Sorry, well, uh, I want, yeah, wanted to build on that a little bit because uh, you look at, uh, most time we typically think of uh, power when we think of geothermal. But it's quite interesting if you look at Europe today, there's a real increase in the amount of geothermal. So now we're getting to the low temp uh, stuff that is actually uh, being built around uh, area heating, you know, whether that's industrial, commercial, uh, municipality, things like that. And I also think the efficiency of the heat exchangers we have have allowed us to migrate that temperature down even from the power side. I mean, if you look at the project Kirsten's got, it's probably a good example. Uh, so just wanted to throw that in as a add on to the geothermal market. Thanks, thanks, Bob. Kirsten, let's bring you in there. What, what sort of temperatures are you, are you looking at in your, in your developments in, the, in Saskatchewan there? So our resource is about 125 degrees Celsius. 
Um, so, you know, certainly on the, the lower range of geothermal, this is not, you know, this is not steam rocketing out of, out of the ground. Certainly doable, to, to, to Bob's previous point, you know, lots of, this is very similar in temperature to what you would find uh, in Munich in the Molasse Basin. So definitely, definitely in the, the realm of, of ec economically viable. But, but the key in these lower temperature blind resources is volume. Right. You know, we we talked earlier uh, when we met the other day about you know, the analogy that I'm sorry, and I didn't say this in my in introduction, my, I've got a mining background. And so I, I always kind of flip this over to these, these, some of these terms and that, you know, if you have a lower temperature resource or a low grade gold mine, you have to mine, you know, a, a lot of, in our case, fluids in order to get the same amount of heat out of the ground. And so the key in these is, is mentioned is, is that not just the heat, but the permeability so that you can flow these projects at, at really, really high rates. And coming from a, the oil and gas sector, the rates that we're moving these fluids at, you know, confuse the oil and gas industry because you would never produce an oil well at anywhere near the rates you would produce these lower temperature geothermal projects. And so, you know, just from our perspective, we 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 done we drilled a number of wells, and um, you know it was a tap on the shoulder from the oil and gas guys that I, I'm working with, and they said, you know, Kirsten, you can you can keep drilling your vertical wells. That's that's cute, um, or you know, come and join the advanced technology that the oil and gas industry has developed and start drilling horizontal wells. Um, we believe that that is really going to be key in these lower temperature blind systems. Um, you, you need you need to embrace that horizontal technology and in, in, in order to to get the volumes that, that are required. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And my, my first job with BP 25 years ago was drilling, <laughs> drilling horizontal wells. So it's it's something oil and gas have been doing doing for a long time. But right. yeah. we don't tend to produce, you know, sort of 60, 70, 80,000 barrels a day of fluid uh, out of them. No. So, it, it is, but you you mentioned their permeability, and maybe maybe that's the elephant in the room. Um, you know, we all know as, as as geoscientists, we know the deeper you drill, the hotter the, the hotter the earth gets, and but the hotter the, the the rocks get, and the longer they're kept hot for, the more cemented up typically they become. You know, your your limestone turns to marble, your sandstone eventually turns to quartzite. You lose that intergranular porosity. You may have some fracture porosity, I think, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, or you you know those fractures may form and then get get cemented up again. So, how how do we go about exploring for maybe these are anomalous settings that we're looking for to, to find where porosity has and permeability has somehow been preserved despite being hot and and having this hot water sitting in it. What what are the sorts of things if if I were an exploration geologist? I, I ought to be going and, and looking for in databases or data sets to, to, to find out. Carl, is, is, that, is that something that we can, we can see seismically or are there other sort of remote sensing tools that one might bring into that, uh, that question? Uh, there's certainly been a lot of progress in the last few years in seismology. Uh, you've seen in oil and gas, the advent of much larger nodal arrays where the cost of seismic acquisition has come down orders of magnitude. So we can get unprecedented resolution into the reservoir. And simultaneous with that, we've also seen huge advances in our ability to process these data sets, to extract meaning and data from these very large data sets using machine learning and just brute computational force. Um, and so we're beginning to get to the point where we can extract fracture properties and characteristics of permeability from that. But I think also at kind of that regional scale, when you're really looking for greenfield or even just combing through existing databases, there's data we can pull from existing well sets or from regional studies on compaction curves or the characteristics as a function of temperature as to how sealed uh, the pore space would be, as you were pointing. And I think there's really this trade-off. The higher temperature resources uh, are great for the power plant and turbine efficiencies at the surface. You don't need as much flow, but the higher temperature you go, the more our drilling capabilities start to break down and the harder it is to find these, particularly for sedimentary resources, resources that aren't already sealed or where they haven't precipitated out too much silica or other minerals within the opening. So uh, I think as Kirsten pointed out, we're sort of in this, we have this new opportunity to go after low grade resources 
Um, and I think back to the old gold explorers would be shocked at the kind of mines that we turn online in Nevada today, where it's half a gram per ton, you know, half a part per million. Um, they were looking for nuggets 100 years ago. And I think in geothermal, there's a similar thing that happened where our early explorers were looking for very high temperature, very large geyser style resources, uh, and maybe under overlooked a lot of these lower temperature resources and didn't quite comb these databases in the way that we can now and the way that Kristen, Kristen's group has done or Kirsten's group has done. Um, one kind of last thing I, I find useful to put this into perspective in terms of how much flow we're looking for are really two comparisons. One is the value per barrel of fluid that we produce. And then two is just the kind of minimum threshold we have to make a, a viable well, a commercially viable well. So we know oil can sell on the order of $50 a barrel. Right now it's probably closer to 70. Um, whereas hot water that we produce from these fields, we're much closer to 10 to 15 cents per barrel. So one tenth of a dollar. These are orders of magnitude less valuable fluids that we're producing, which means we have to produce them at orders of magnitude higher flow rates. Uh, and for example, there, um, today in the Permian Basin, uh, a successful well stimulated horizontal legs, you might get just over a thousand barrels per day. In geothermal, most of our commercially viable wells for conventional systems are 30 times that, are 30,000 barrels per day. And this just presents a whole new challenge when it comes to characterization. It means we have very little margin for error and we really have to get better at characterizing the subsurface prior to drilling. And so to your question, the tools, it, we need ways of better characterizing the stress states, the fracture properties, characterizing what we're going to get before we drill and how that reservoir will interact. Um, I think it becomes especially important for geothermal. Very good. Yeah, that's uh, it's a great, great point. I hadn't thought about that before about the, the sort of the, the, the value of a barrel and then the, 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 the difference mm -hmm. in flow rates. I, I like that. That's a really good, good way of thinking about it. So if that's the, if that's the sort of the pre-drilling um, uh, interpretation and, and, and analysis. Bob, you mentioned earlier about uh, about wireline logging. Your, your, your days, I guess, you started started out in the in, in the logging truck. What are the what are the tools? Are the, do we have the tools that we that we need to having having drilled a well? And as Carl says, it's you know, it's vital that we can we can produce the well hard, and we can understand where that production's coming from. I guess particularly in a in a in a fractured setting, understanding where where are the fractures occurring. Do, do we have the sorts of downhole tools to be able to, to help us with that? Depends on which market we're chasing. So you look at, uh, true, right? If we're looking at conventional high temp, 200C plus is all of a sudden the arsenal of tools is limited. And so you look at an LWD wireline today, 200C is about the limit that you can get. But if you look at the broad assortment of what we're doing with the EGS side of the arena, where we start addressing a lot of the stuff below 200C, all of a sudden you get this huge arsenal. There's very li few limitations of what we can get. And so first and foremost, and I think uh, Gazelle would, uh, can really expound upon this, is getting good information to understand the stress environment, the fractures that exist. And so then there's all the data that goes with that. You know, then the second part of it, oh, now we've got the well. What are we going to do? And it's a new well to understand the connectivity of it, the volumes of it, you know, what kind of testing, whether that's injection testing, production testing, and then be able to monitor over time. And that's one of the areas where things have improved significantly with the uh, drop in cost in fiber, the temperature increase in fiber. So there's a whole lot of things I think that can tie together. But I think Carl hit upon it. A lot of the things that have been done in the last five years is integrating that data, piling it together and actually using that with a bunch of AI stuff. I think Stanford published one, I think it was 17, of using that to be able to find, oh, here's all the things that work for success. So these are things I gotta be looking forward if I'm gonna to try to replicate that. So just things that help from an exploration, but then also from a development. But uh, Giselle can add to the component, the key part is understanding the geomechanics, whether it's a natural fracture system or an EGS system, we're gonna create it. <laughs> Gazelle, do you want to uh, to respond to that? Yeah, thank you, Bob. Yeah, that's, I fully agree with you, and thanks for emphasizing on that. I think I would like to combine what Carl mentioned and Bob said, right? So one of the challenges today is that how we bridge the gap between different scale of data. 
So what we see from the seismic information is in the meter scale, when we are talking about the well log data, which is, for example, for fracture characterization, we use borehole imaging, right? High resolution borehole imaging, which is we can see centimeter from the well bore. So how we bridge the gap from the well bore wall to your formation and your reservoir. So there are technology developed that we can go around 30 meter to see the formation, to see the fractures in terms of orientation, intensity, um, uh, and uh, uh, the, the type of fracture, is it open or closed? So what we learn in unconventional, as, uh, as Bob mentioned, the accelerated learning in unconventional was amazing. The type of technology developed for the complex geology and the, uh, the uh, geological setting and the fracture system needs to be understood because if we don't have hydraulic fracture interconnect to the natural fracture, we don't have the right volume around the well to uh, suck the uh, hydrocarbon from the formation. So I think this, there is a lot of similarity between unconventional development and geothermal. Um, and uh, so this type of technology needs to be deployed uh, because uh, uh, in, in geothermal, we are dealing with a different fracture system. We are not hydraulically stimulated in some EGS cases. We are starting to apply fluid prop to create the hydraulic fracture in 100 meters, right, which we haven't done it before. Most of the stimulation techniques in geothermal is shear stimulating, that we are pumping the fluid into the fracture, we open up the fracture, and we, uh, we shear the fractures to create the permeability and open up the fractures. So um, I think this technology, which we call it deep shear wave images, which is acoustic tool cross dipole, there is always a limitation on the temperature as Bob mentioned, right? When we are dealing with a high uh, enthalpy uh, fluid, so, and the hot rock. The other piece, which is very important is that why not we are using our uh, cutting analysis during the drilling. So there is a lot of information we can gain on the mineralogy, right? And the type of mineralogy that we are dealing because ultimately the mineralogy dictates how the heat capacity and the thermal transfer from the fluid to rock to your wellhead. So there are low hanging data acquisition, multi-scale data evaluation is available for us that we can adopt and adapt from unconventional to geothermal. So Bob, I hope that I answered the, <laughs> and followed what you, you mentioned. And that. <laughs> that's great. So you, you mentioned that the stimulation word there, and that's that's obviously, I mean, talking about the, these well rates and the, and the typical permeabilities and the need the need to produce so such a high high volume of fluid. That that of course is is now de rigueur in in in, in parts of the states and and has been widely developed in in, in unconventional settings. Do do you have any concerns about about the broader applicability of that around the world? Is this, is this something that can be more readily done in, in geothermal energy than perhaps in, 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 in oil and gas? Is it, is it gonna be more acceptable in places like Switzerland or Southern Germany was, was an example that was mentioned earlier? Um, or or do you, do you, have, we got, have we got issues to deal with there if we want to, to really develop these resources in those sorts of situations? Is, is it a PR thing or is there a, is there a real need to uh, develop new technologies in, in those areas? So I think, I think this is a very good point, right? And it's not all about the technology deployment, it's also about regulation, right? So we, are, we need to talk about induced seismicity and the triggering earthquakes, which goes back to the fundamental of geomechanics. What type of a stress state we are dealing? What type of fracture system? How we drill these wells? When we are starting to pressurize these fractures, are we creating earthquakes? And then we are talking about but micro earthquakes, it's below zero, right? And some people say, what does that mean? Uh, magnitude below zero? Yes, minus two, minus three, maybe we need to meet, uh, monitor it, right? So I think uh, a robust monitoring system in order to uh, act and prevent any of the, uh, uh, any of the damage that you may uh, bring to the system. And you see that uh, last year in France, the project was shut down. We had a similar, uh, upper, uh, situation in Indonesia because you are creating some large uh, earthquake uh, around one or two uh, magnitude that the project should be shut down. But if we do our due diligence to understand your mechanics, 
And when we are deploying the operational strategy, make sure that we assess the risk and mitigate the risk by the monitoring the system. I don't think that we may have some issues that we, we cannot prevent if we, uh, if we uh, put those uh, uh, systems in place, like a traffic system that we did in, uh, in unconventional. So when, when the rate is uh, huge, like uh, what we saw in Oklahoma and you see huge earthquakes, everybody uh, thought that it's because of the hydraulic fracturing, but it was not. So it was because of the wastewater disposal injection. So again, this type of monitoring really allow you to understand what's going on in the subsurface and how you can provide a solution. One other comment, Nick, your comment, do we need to be doing PR? I think in everything we do, we need to be doing PR, <laughs> PR and engaging the community is it's a, not a us, they, or anything else, is we don't engage the community to understand what we're doing, to do it safely, how it's going to benefit them and everything. You know, we're missing a real opportunity for uh, involvement. I mean, I look at it as, I think uh, Kirsten probably has an interesting story, is how do you gain success in something that even in an area where drilling, oil, and gas, and everything is accepted, but she's doing something different, you know? And so, yeah. but I do agree is one of the things that is, if we don't do it right, plan in advance, understanding the risk, and do everything we can do to mitigate the risk, then we end up creating an adverse situation that has an impact on all of us. And with the, the need to go through this energy transition, just to supply the increased demand we need for power, is those are things that we don't need uh, in the geothermal industry or, or anything from the energy industry. Yeah, education is, is, is king. So, you know, where, where we're working in Saskatchewan, this is the heart of oil and gas uh, territory in, 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 in this province. And so, I mean, the people that in the community, the, the, the farmers in the area are really, really comfortable and, and aware of, of whether it's horizontal drilling or, or hydraulic stimulation. And so having that baseline, we didn't have to do the work, right? The work was done for us by, by the oil and gas industry in, in, in educating how does this work? What are the risks? You know, what's... Um, you know, what's, what's the process? People are people are really familiar with it in that area. So we're very grateful that, that we haven't had to do a lot of very specific PR about drilling and, and, and the possibility of, of stimulation as well. I, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll mention it briefly here. It's not really blind geothermal, but the, the team that have developed, we've, we've now got a geothermal development in the UK, at United Downs, and, and congratulations to that, to that team there. But I will say, watching that from afar, the way that they've engaged with their local community and the, and the PR and go, reaching out to schools and bringing in other businesses around the, around the whole thing, it's got a very different vibe to it from looking from it from an oil and gas perspective. It, it doesn't feel like an energy development. It feels, you know, it looks like a community development. And um, I think that's that's to their credit. Now, that's blind geothermal is a bit different, but uh, it's what they've done there in terms of the outreach and information and education, as you say, I think is, 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 is salutary. I think there's, there's, there's maybe something we can learn there. Right. Are there any other risks that we need to think about apart from, you know, in, induced seismicity or, or anything else? Are, are, are all the, do we understand enough about the way that fluids flow in these, let's say these sedimentary systems, we've got decades of experience of producing oil and gas or re-injecting produced water and things like that. What, what, are there, are there any other risks and, and, and how do we, do we have the tools that we need to, to be able to manage them? Is that, maybe that's, of, uh, oh, go ahead, Bob. I was gonna say one of the things that, and is constantly improving is the ability to model for the new EGS systems, uh, particularly whether you're creating the connectivity or you're doing closed loop systems. You know, when we look at it as a, a building heating system, you know, radiator system. Uh, we've been very good because we've been doing that for hundreds of years. But as we start doing that downhole and understanding uh, how much fluid are we going to have to move, how much reservoir contact are we going to have to have, the reservoir being the heat contact, we'll be able to get the type of rates that we need. And so there's been tremendous advances in that side of the system that help reduce that uncertainty as we start planning because in the end, that's what our uh, managers and the bankers are going to want to know. Will these projects work? Uh, ab absolutely. And, you know, just to, to follow on that, the, and do we, your question, Nick, do, you know, do we, do we know enough? 
Well, the reality is no. I mean, every every one of these systems is is going to be different. It's all every system is going to have its unique challenges. You know, whether it's finding that that fine line between uh, you know deep enough to be hot enough, but not too deep where you you know you're losing your permeability. Um, you're going to have different fracture systems. You're going to have different water chemistry situations. It's it's a real challenge. Each system, there is no never going to be an analogy. It's like, well, this worked in this one location, so we just do exactly the same thing, and it'll work somewhere else. And I think you know, from you know, as a geothermal community, I think this is one of the things that we see is 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 makes these projects hard, right? They're, if they were super easy, everyone would have done this a long, long time ago. They're they're hard. They're challenging. There's a lot of upfront costs um, in making, in identifying and characterizing these, these resources. And, you know, I, I think that these projects, even 10 years ago, um, wouldn't get the, the, the grant support, the equity support, um, because those challenges are real. Today, um, I, I think I, we can all say the world has changed and that there's a lot more interest and support in, in working through those maybe upfront costs, those upfront challenges in, in characterizing these, these blind resources because it's worth it, right? It's worth it. People want to get behind these projects from a, from a dollar standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint um, and, and get these projects to the finish line. Right. <laughs> so, do, do yeah. you have a hand up? Yeah, so I just want to add a, another aspect, which is more related to the production challenges, right? So we need to keep the flow. So the other two key challenges that we are facing for geothermal projects is around the corrosion and the scaling, right? As Christian mentioned, so we need to our due diligence, not only to understand the fluid composition, right? We need to understand the fluid and rock interaction at different temperature level. So that, that leads us to see that, okay, what type of production solution can be in the picture in order to keep the flow going uh, when we are we, when we see the flow start to decline. So we want to keep up the flow. And then that means that what type of chemical solution could be uh, deployed in the system? What type of ESP pumps could uh, uh, make the flow, uh, assure the flow is going? So. I would like to a little bit um, uh, highlight what uh, Bob mentioned. Can we afford to drill well to learn from it, or should we bring physics and the models into the picture? Right. Mm -hmm. So what we so if you look at the uh, typical well cost uh, for geothermal is around 36 uh, percent of the total project cost, and if you look at the global cost per well uh, to uh, well construction is around 5 million, right? So when we are talking about the economics, about the viability of the project, so how we can ensure that we don't need to spend 20 million to learn from the subsurface. So spending the right data acquisition plan, bring the right modeling techniques, right? Both from the data-driven and physics-based is really accelerating, uh, accelerating the learning. And, and that this is exactly what we learn from unconventionals, right? So the well that we are drilling in Middle East is around eight to $9 million, right? Um, in US it's 4 million. So this, this is how we need to move faster and do something different in the area. This is more complex and it's more costly, right? The during duration, the, the, the challenges during the well construction, and in geothermal, it's a lot of uh, a lot of risk is during the drilling, right? So today in uh, um, Pens uh, in Marcello Shell, we can drill the horizontal well 10 to 15,000 feet in in a week, and when you look at the vertical well in geothermal, it takes between 45 to 100 days to drill it and complete it is because of the rate of penetration, because of the lot of circulation loss, uh, the mud loss, um, uh, drill, uh, the life of the drill bit. So it goes back again to the subsurface, right? What type of geomechanics, geological understanding we have in order to design the whole system better in order to bring the operational efficiency and the reducing the cost. Yeah, I very much want to kind of agree with that. And also what Christian said earlier, that each of these systems is so unique that it's hard to just go to a new area and assume we've already figured this out elsewhere. It's going to work the same here. Um, I think when you watch the unconventionals history in oil and gas, 
we entered a lot of those basins, whether it was the Bakken or the Williston or the Permian, thinking, oh, we figured this out. We know where the source rock is. It's all going to be homogeneous and we just have to engineer it, right? You almost don't need geologists anymore. Um, but I think once the money was spent and the, drill, the wells were drilled, we quickly learned that there were only a few winners, uh, really, and that there was a lot more heterogeneity, even in the geology, than we were anticipating. And I, I imagine we're going to find the same in geothermal. Um, and, and that's part of kind of the exciting challenge ahead of us. But also the opportunity we have is that both on the engineering side, uh, we're going to see significant cost declines and understanding how to engineer and design these well systems. But also on the geology side, I think we're going to start to find that there are these sort of fairways or sweet spots, even within our hot sedimentary basins that we've already identified. I think we, you hit upon it, well, uh, Carl. It's not a layer cake, don't we? It's, uh, it is heterogeneous. Sorry, Bob, you were going to say something. Well, I was just saying, yes, I think it was uh, Carl's choice of uh, words, you know, is there was this period when everybody thought we could just execute the same thing over and over. But I think there was something else we learned out of that, is that we followed the same type of process and realized that we have to make sure we get good information early in the cycle on this, 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 and this. That way we can direct of what we need to do that's different in that basin. I think it took us a few uh, basins of stubbing our toll and uh, a few expanded areas that we thought were gonna be great that weren't to learn that. So I think that's probably the biggest thing is you have to not ask enough questions on the front end. Yeah. And I, th I think that's something we've learned in oil and gas. Um, you know, the, the drill bit, however much you reduce your drilling costs, it's quite an expensive way of, of, of finding things out. So. As Gazelle was saying about the, the modeling and Carl was talking about the geophysics, I think, you know, the more that we can do to reduce uncertainty ahead of the drill bit prior to making those, those you know, big million, multi-million dollar drilling decisions, um, the, uh, the, the, you know, seismic's not cheap, but it's, uh, it's, cheaper than, uh, it's cheaper than making some very deep holes in the, in, mm -hmm. in the ground, perhaps. Are there any other geophysical techniques? Just that I keep, I keep defaulting to seismic and that's that's probably my oil and gas background but are there any other sort of perhaps non-seismic techniques that we ought to be thinking about or developing further in this in this sphere carl are you uh... i mean there, there are certain tools that are still pretty standard in conventional geothermal and that i think are quite applicable here uh we'll probably continue to use gravity to better model these basins uh, electromagnetics, resistivity are going to continue to be important. Um, even at that large scale regional exploration for temperature, there are tools like curry point depth mapping where we're, or other ways of looking at mantle temperatures or the depth to the brittle ductile transition zone. These proxies are indicators for what the geothermal gradient is and what we might expect in these less drilled or less explored basins. Um, I imagine we'll start with a lot of our well-characterized oil and gas basins as we're kind of getting our feet wet here. But some of the best high temperature resources are probably not where the oil and gas was, right? And so a lot of the Nevada basins where we never found much more than Railroad Valley, and so we stopped drilling in Nevada, those are basins we'll need to go out and characterize from scratch. And, and we don't have that benefit of relying upon existing well fields or existing seismic from oil and gas development. Um, and so I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity there as well. I think the other technology, if you can uh, put it in the category of Hi. Have we lost Gazelle? Can you hear me, Gazelle? Uh, I'll just pop in with a quick story. Just, well, uh, well Gazelle comes unfrozen here um just 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 for some humor you know in oil and gas when you're when you're looking at your well logs you know there's certain indicators that you know you're looking for for oil right you're looking at the gamma well for us we were always kind of laughing because we were we had to reprogram our heads to watch the gamma go the other way <laughs> right that's you know for us it's like because we're, we're looking for water not oil and gas so for us you know in, in a well-established um oil and gas field um, you know, the, the logs, the, the logs will show you where you've got permeability and where you've got water. Very, very, very good. Well, hopefully, hopefully Gazelle comes back in and we'll, we'll get to hear her point in a moment when she comes back in. Um, I, I'm looking 
we've got a whole load of great questions coming in here from the audience. So maybe I, I can I can turn my turn my attention to some of these perhaps. Um, so there's a question here about we haven't really talked about reservoir pressures. So are these are these generally um, normally pressured systems that we that we that we're talking about here? Um, and is the potential for sort of multi-phase fluids within the within the within the, the, the systems? Is that something that you see in the in the Wilson Basin, Kirsten? So pressure. So this is an interesting comment because because we are such a big water moving project, trying to find the right balance on the production and the injection side is really key. Because with any kind of large fluid moving project. It involves a lot of pumps and those pumps use a ton of power. So trying to reduce the, the delta P between the production and the injection side is actually one of, one of our biggest challenges that we just worked through on the, our, our feasibility engineering and trying to design that well field so that, you know, to, to make sure that we had the, the smallest change in, in pressure. In our situation, you know, the wells don't don't flow to surface. They flow to it about um, about 300 meters from surface. So you know, you have to pump them. They're not pressured so much that this is going to flow to surface. But the challenge is if it's if it's, if it's really really overpressured, well, then you're going to have a real challenge on getting your injection fluids back into that same formation. So yeah, I'm glad you asked about pressure. Pressure is is probably as as important as the permeability and the chemistry and all of those those factors balance together to find uh, the appropriate way of developing a field. Interesting, interesting stuff. As Carl, wouldn't you say that most of the discoveries that uh, thus far tend to be at hydrostatic or below? Yep. On mute, Carl. Apologies uh, for the fault hosted systems. I think that's correct. I, I'm less familiar with the sedimentary basin systems that uh, have been explored or developed. It's one of the things that one of the areas of interest is the Gulf uh, Coast is because of the overpressured saline reservoirs, you know, that oh, will have this ability to get flow right away. But then it becomes an issue like you're mentioning, Kirsten, am I going to have sufficient flow for long term production naturally or am I going to have to figure out how to inject all that water back into the same formation? overcoming that pressure. Yeah. Here's, here's another thing that we haven't really talked about um, is, is about the availability of data. Um, and, and I guess, so the, the question is, um, lots of countries and companies worry about intellectual property. How can the geothermal community share more data? How can oil and gas companies be encouraged to share their data about where these systems may be located? And that, Maybe that's something like Kirsten, you were saying earlier, you know, these, these are wells that have been, the, the basin's been drilled a lot for oil and gas. You need that information from those oil and gas wells to say, actually, there's a, there's a geothermal prospect here. So how, how can we enable that? What, what needs to be done to, to stop the big bad oil and gas boys? And I can say that working for BP. How, how, do, how, do, we, how do we stop the big bad oil and gas boys sitting on the data and, and, and keeping these, these things hidden from everybody else? That's a great question. And I, I think probably, I mean, we're, we're so fortunate uh, here in Saskatchewan that that, that data is, is public. So I haven't had to work through that challenge, but I think in, if you look across the border, just into North Dakota, it, it's, a, it's a different world. There's, you know, the core doesn't get saved. There's, there's a lot of data that gets lost. So I think now as we look through potential partnerships with those oil and gas companies, I think there's the opportunity to be, and I, I don't, you know, I know there's a lot of phrasing around energy transition. Well, if you're an oil and gas company, that's not necessarily the, the phrasing you want to hear. And I think if we adapt partnerships through energy diversification, um, those oil and gas companies might see a, a lot more value in, in, in sharing that data um, and, and supporting another energy project um, that they could support within their energy portfolio. I think one of the other things you that uh, along that arena, there is a lot of countries, Canada being one of them, that there's tremendous amount of information available. If you look at the US, not so much. I mean, there is a fair amount, but how do we get kick-started or, or shorten that learning cycle in the unconventionals? There actually was a series of consortiums that were built. So it was actually, we created it within the industry mechanisms to exchange that information. And so I think that's what's gonna, 
be driven by whether you want the culture or the mindset of the companies, the countries themselves. The countries may come out and say, hey, we want to accelerate this and that this type of information has to be made available. We don't know. We don't make the policy. But I think there is things we can do as the industry. Conferences like this, I mean, uh, Jamie and the, and the entire board uh, uh, setting this up as a, as a mechanism to exchange information is just the, the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of good discussions on the panels I've sat in already, and I'm sure I'll learn more the rest of the week. And certainly, I think, you know, again, encouraging in, in these in these areas where there is data that isn't being shared is, is, you know, trying to be able to communicate that, listen, there's more than one resource developer can, can play in the same sandbox, right? So, I mean, if, if, if we're ge a geothermal company isn't interested in the oil and gas data, so that, that, that data can be trimmed so that, um, you know, these these projects can coexist at the same locations. There's nothing wrong with that. Very good. Um, Gazal, I, I see your name appearing here now. Hopefully you, you are, we, are we able to hear you? <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, if you have a power outage here, so I'm connecting with my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the irony, if only you had a reliable uh, <laughs> source of, uh, of energy that was low carbon and 24-7, uh, which maybe that's, a, maybe that's as good an intro into that. We talked a little bit earlier about the risks, but the, the, the opportunities and the value of geothermal here. Um, does, does blind hydrothermal systems, do they offer the same advantages that we'd see in, in, in other forms of geothermal energy? 24-7 um, power, low surface footprints, um, those those sorts of things. Gazelle. Yeah, that this is a very good point. Actually, I am thinking about going outside in California around the area I'm living to find some blind hydrothermal because <laughs> it's not acceptable not to have a power. <laughs> so no, I think I think Nick, this is a, this is a very good question, and I don't think that the blind hydro hydrothermal is different from the other source of uh, or other systems, right? The only thing is that we need to think about how we better find and characterize this this uh, uh, this type of systems um, uh, in order to make it economical and viable. Um, the heat is uh, under uh, or beneath our our feet, right? How we can use it, and we are seeing different type of uh, systems. For example, Kristen mentioned that in Canada we found this uh, hydrothermal system, which is in the range of 120 degree Celsius. And then we see some in like, uh, Africa project, like, like Kenya or Djibouti, that uh, the, the temperature level is higher, uh, but, but the, 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 we don't have enough uh, learning from oil and gas, right? In order to reduce the cost of the characterization and make this energy live in order to produce uh, electricity, right? From heat to electron. So, but in, in summary, I don't think that uh, uh, there is any difference between the type of geothermal uh, power that we are generating. The only difference is that how much cost uh, and uh, risk we are dealing with, right, for different systems if we are not uh, uh, doing the process and uh, evaluate and assess the risk and bring the right uh, technology for the development. Um, I'm, I'm looking down. Jamie's been very efficient here in sending me all these great questions from the audience. I'm, I'm looking here. There's, there's, there's a couple more that have, that have, that have, that have come in. Um, this is, this is looping back to the, the conversation about, about logging um, and um, high temperature problems. The bottom hole circulation temperature in properly cooled wells can be less than the formation temperature. Standard mud motors and MWD are within their limits. Is, is that, is that a, a valid a valid statement? Can we can we cool the well sufficiently to um, run the, the the existing tools even if the formation is hotter? There's a, there's a bit of a bit of a gamble, isn't it? If you have to interrupt your circulation and and then your your, your tools are suddenly uh, too too warm. One of those uh, questions, uh, you can say yes, we can do it, and they'll say, but I want to go to 300 C, and I'm going to say no, we can't do that. <laughs> and so you look at in, in geothermal drilling using mud chillers or even even in, in deep uh, uh, oil and gas wells where we're pushing 200 C or plus. That's very common that we we'll use mud uh, chillers to cool the mud before we uh, circulate. 
And the whole purpose, of course, is to improve the reliability of the downhole, the BHA, to be able to get information. And so there's things like that that, uh, that we can adopt from oil, oil and gas uh, to the geothermal uh, arena. Uh, but like I said, it gets down to what's the temperature we're targeting. 200 C and below is the odds go up significantly that we can get all the information we need. We start pushing 200 C in some of the deep uh, dry hot rock projects that are proposed, then we'll, we'll end up having challenges. Those will be some things that we have to uh, develop as an industry. And I think it's then a priority of information, uh, what we need, so we focus on the things that will give us the most information uh, immediately. Right. Comment on that, uh, just that idea of the temperature that we need to reach. I think it's worth remembering there are hundreds of gigawatts worth of geothermal below that 200 degrees Celsius threshold, you know, closer to 150 Celsius. Uh, and so I think a lot of the drilling technology we already have is ready to go, ready to be mobilized. And so when thinking about the opportunity, we still have these challenges, the high flow rates characterizing these resources, but there's some unique benefits or upside to geothermal that I think the oil and gas industry can appreciate or benefit from. One is the fact that we sign long-term contracts at fixed prices on these, right? And so if you develop one of these fields, you're going to have a 30-year consistent stream of revenue. And that's something I think most oil and gas majors wish they could have. Uh, rather than being subject to that long-term volatility. And so what kind of confidence or support can that provide to that entire working industry? Uh, other aspects, those, it's not just power that we're selling. Uh, it was already mentioned, the direct use and the downstream applications, as well as mineral co-production. And so there's a lot of other value we can extract from these resources. Um, and so I, I think it is really worth recognizing we have some near-term challenges. Um, but we've only really touched the tip of the iceberg here. And it's exciting to think that we're benefiting already from the transfer of learning from oil and gas who have drilled orders of magnitude more wells than geothermal has. But we're also going to see other benefits from getting to scale. Uh, for example, just our, our power plants are getting more efficient each year, each decade. Um, but imagine if instead of installing gigawatts, we were installing hundreds of gigawatts of these, how much more would we see the cost decline for the top side engineering and the operating costs? So I think across the board, sedimentary and these conventional resources in particular are about to benefit from all of those learnings and cost declines. Along that area, haven't you also seen, Carl, that from uh, the top sides, the modular construction, which is one of the things that oil and gas went to modular production facilities in you know, new countries to ramp up as the production increased. So doing that for geothermal, uh, what do you want to call incremental bites as you bring wells online? Yeah, huge benefits there in cost and installation um, and the ability to even move them when a project is done or the power is no longer needed there. That was something geothermal never had the option or ability to do. And so it kind of takes away some of that risk uh, for your capital expense. Nick, I, I want to add one more to this uh, question. Uh, so I would like to highlight about the project that uh, we finished in Iceland because our conversation is Iceland. And uh, one of the uh, hottest, deepest uh, well, which we drilled uh, a few years ago uh, around 300 degrees C. So what, what we learned uh, from this project is that the drilling of this challenging uh, hostile environment needs uh, and requires the optimization of the system. What does that mean? It means that it's a combination of the bit selection technology, hybrid bits, uh, the type of drilling system, as well as the fluid that we are using. So when we are talking about more hotter and deeper rock, uh, it's more abrasive. Uh, it's uh, the quartz content is higher. It's more challenging to drill these wells. However, this type of uh, integration of the technology and tools in order to drill these wells and how long we need to stay in the hole and what type of cooling system we need to introduce. So this is not new to us, right? So we have been drilling these high temperature deep wells uh, for years, but again, as Christian mentioned, each system is different, uh, different types of understanding is required, but the technology advancements, both in geothermal and uh, on conventional, is really help us to really uh, uh, get into this, uh, to this system and pro uh, produce heat and uh, uh, electricity uh, for the future uh, of the geothermal development. Thanks, Gazelle. So, 
we're, we're, we're nearly out of time here. Jeremy, uh, uh, Jamie is frantically mes messaging me that we need to uh, we need to to come to a close. So um, what I will do, though, is to, to go around. Let's go around the panel and let's give everybody if, in, in one minute your, your sort of closing statement, your closing thoughts on on, on the topic. Um, and let's start with uh, with Kirsten. Closing statements. Well, I, I think these are exciting times. I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm new to the geothermal industry. I, I guess it's been 10 years, but I, you know, what I, what I, what I, what I've learned in this 10 years is 10 years ago, a lot of these projects didn't make sense because there wasn't the support for these projects. There, there, there wasn't the interest. And as a consequence, they just seemed too hard. Right. Um, I think what we're seeing today, the fact that we have this panel and we're having this discussion and we're seeing the excitement about these lower temperature resources, um, it gives me en enormous enthusiasm that, you know, what we'll be talking about 10 years from now is that we'll have established many of these more challenging, invisible geothermal resources. Um, I think this is really exciting times for this for this industry. You know where you know 20 years ago 30 years ago the, the easy ones were, were developed um and then there was kind of a quieting period in, in geothermal where, where some of the harder ones seemed too challenging and here we are today these projects are being advanced we're having you know a great discussion of all the various technology um whether it's whether it's size uh, seismic or what have you all, all the all the tools and technologies that we can apply to to make these projects easier um, and, and to get these, these projects developed. And so uh, just in closing, I say it's a real pleasure to be part of this panel and have this discussion and, and see this optimism uh, for this really this, this, this brand new segment of, of the geothermal industry going ahead. Right, thanks Kirsten. Carl, let's go to you next. Uh, briefly, your, your closing thoughts. Um, similar to Kirsten, I'm just very excited to see this energy here. And I think it's worth noting you know, it's not just that we're coming together to talk, but we're seeing capital flow into the space. We're seeing human resources flow into the space and all of that is necessary. We've seen more venture investment into geothermal in the last 12 months than we've seen in the last 10 years. And I think that's telling, um, you know, both for the market uh, changes that we're seeing, but also that willingness to transfer into it. Um, I think though with that, it's always worth recognizing whenever we get excited, we sometimes get ahead of ourselves and our excitement can set us up for spectacular disappointment when we realize the real timeline, right? The real hard work that's ahead of us still. And so these are the early innings. And uh, I would expect that we're going to have our cylindras of geothermal, right? We're going to have a spectacular failure or two, maybe even an induced earthquake somewhere. And I would hope that when these occur, uh, the investors in the space, that the media, and that we ourselves don't lose uh, our, our excitement, but that we judge each project and each technology for its own merits, for its scientific potential, um, and that we sort of stay that long-term vision. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Bob, your, uh, your thoughts? Thank you for moderating this, Nick, and, and it's been a real pleasure uh, being on the panel with the rest of the people. We could probably go on for the rest of the day, uh, enough diversity and enthusiasm. Uh, I guess I'm excited about it, uh, uh, well aware that we're gonna have the ups and downs. It's, ha it's happened in every development, but having been involved when we started with tight gas, COVID, methane, or all these things, we all that uh, occurred. And like I said earlier, the thing that excites me the most is I think we're better at knowing what we don't know. So when we plan projects, we plan at the front end to get that information, to reduce that uncertainty quicker so that we shorten that learning cycle. But uh, I, I find it uh, quite interesting when you look at drilling the DJ Basin 40 years ago, and it took them a week to drill a well that was 8,000 feet deep to do a vertical completion. And today we can drill something with a two mile lateral at that same type of depth and the whole well is done in less time than it took to drill a well before. You know, it's drilled, encased, and ready to complete. So it's an amazing thing what uh, we can do with technology and a mindset. Uh, you know, here's what the goal is, and then put in our mind to solving the problem so that we can do it cost effectively and efficiently. So I think we'll see the same type of process as we go forward in geothermal. There'll be this real blending of knowledge, and then the unique characteristics or challenges that we have. You know, there's a lot of brilliant people who come out there and say, if we just twist this, 
whether it's materials or whatever, to make a big difference. And I'll just mention one of them. It's like the problem with corrosion is, so Europe's doing some very interesting things. They're going to glass reinforced epoxy lined production strings. And the whole deal with the hardness and stuff, the scale just doesn't like it. So it extends the life between having to work over wells. So just little things that are already coming in the industry. So thank right. you, Thanks, uh, Pat, Nick. Yeah, thanks. We're, 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 we're over time, but Giselle, very briefly, your, your, your closing thoughts. Yes, thank you. I, I would appreciate uh, all of you, my uh, panelists. Uh, fellow Nick, thank you so much for moderating this great session and to Jamie. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm short, so uh, it was great conversation. So we need technology, we need new commercial models, we need, we need new financial uh, approach, right, for geothermal development. And the last but not least is about talents, how we can adopting and develop talents that we can bring to into this system, right? To this energy frontier um, uh, uh, segment, because we are committed to be uh, uh, net zero. Uh, we, we need, uh, we are committed to take energy forward. And I think it, it's going uh, through the uh, close collaboration between academia, technology companies, developer, and the government. So thank you so much and uh, appreciate all your times. Great. Thanks, Gazelle. And, and I'll, I'll just close by saying thank you very much to the panel. Uh, I've, it's been fantastic talking with you all. So much experience and expertise and intelligent thought about this, about this area. Such an exciting area of geothermal energy um, and uh, one that I'm sure that we in oil and gas can, can turn our heads to and, and hopefully our investments to, um, to, to help decarbonize and to provide those, those important you know, low carbon 24 seven sources of energy that the world needs. So I won't, I won't, I won't talk anymore. Jamie, Jamie wants me off the air. So I'll just close by saying thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jamie, for the platform, and really looking forward to the rest of the the, the pivot sessions. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. You. Thanks. Thank you.